Keith Hayden is a digital entrepreneur, a digital novelist, former U.S. military, Toastmaster president, and overall great guy. I love talking to Keith, and I hope you like this episode because it's full of value. If you want to become a writer, if you want to become a digital entrepreneur, you will learn so much. So let's go. Let's dive in. You were talking about your focus right now and about how one of the hardest things nowadays is that people can't do one thing for 100 days in a row and people have that hard time, you know, being consistent with things. Yeah. You get that shiny object syndrome in which, you know, you start with Duolingo or something for one month and then you see that you will hit a wall and you'll notice how much you actually don't know. So how do you see all of those things, Keith? Um, well, I think it starts with the beginner mindset. And I think that's what a lot of people struggle with. Because once you reach a certain level in your career, you know, you've gone through the wickets of school, you've gone through the the job initiation. These These are hard things to go through. Everybody has to go through when they're younger in some form. So once you get over those hills, you're like, I made it. All of a sudden, you feel like, you know, think of yourself, well, you're you're a little bit younger, so it, maybe you're not too far removed from this era, but I am. And I think of myself at 23, 24, thinking, like, I was big shit. Like, I already knew, <laughs> like, what I needed to do and, you know, professionally in that sense. So to to go into a new domain, whatever it is, and be like, holy shit, it's reset. You're at level zero all of a sudden. That's a hard mental shift that I think prevents people from from continuing on with with certain skills that gets them to quit. And that's that. And the second thing is how easy it is to get started in things these days. I mean it's mm -hmm. as simple as a YouTube search. How do I how do I speak Portuguese? You'll get dozens, hundreds of videos saying, start here, this Watch this video. This is how you do it. Da da da. And it feels so motivating to just take one or two of those videos and be like, "Oh shit!" Like, I could really learn po Portuguese. Like, I'm, or or you start speaking and you do it, and you're like, "Wow, this is crazy." But can you do that for a week, for thirty days? I'd argue most people can't because it's so you know. And we we all have the YouTube feeds. You know, they know like that. The feed, right? They're they're feeding you, you know, you search Brazilian Portuguese and then adjacent is like, oh, here's City of God. Mm -hmm. Do you want to watch the movie? All of a sudden you start watching the movie and you're like, oh, this is a great movie. Are you still learning Portuguese at that point? Oh, and then you go to the next YouTuber. Here's somebody who's in Sao Paulo and they're showing you all around. Here's the beaches. Here's the best clubs. Here's the best hotels. Are you learning Portuguese at that point? We, we and, and I'm saying this because I've fallen into these traps, right? You you think you're getting shit done, but you slowly skewed. All of a sudden, you're four or five videos deep. You know how to feed them to you, and you ain't learned a lick of Portuguese. You were watching some foreigner who was down there on exchange and knew a few slick sentences. And this is just an example I'm giving to how easy it is to get distracted from your goals these days and what you're doing and why I'd argue most people these days, they just, they don't see progress and then they get frustrated, right? Because you go through this cycle a couple of times, like right? maybe you show up the next week and you're like, okay, it's Portuguese or nothing. And then the cycle repeats itself. You get serious, you start doing something, you take notes. And I know somebody who's listening to this or watching in this, this is ha this happens every day, and some people will call it ADHD. Some people will call it. Some people do legitimately have ADHD, but I'd argue that look, YouTube, X, all the social media, they have been optimized to do this, to keep you on there. To and I'm not, not talking about lizard people or conspiracies. This is just facts. Like these are no. platforms that are engineered by some of the greatest minds in the world to do what it's doing to you. It happens to me, too, and I'm not immune to this. You know, I have this happen. I put in a lot of guardrails to, to make sure it doesn't happen, but occasionally, uh, you know, you're tired, you've done some work, and all of a sudden, you hit a YouTube rabbit hole of 
pick your poison, movie mm-hmm. reviews, game streaming, whatever. Everybody has that thing, you know, ASMR, whatever your thing is, they've got it in droves and it's designed to keep you feeding you more the more that you do it. So yeah, that's how I think of it, man. It's just it's just difficult these days. Bottom line, it's harder. To, it's harder to focus, harder to concentrate, and that holds a lot of people back. Really struggles. Yeah, we have too many options. I think that's that's the thing. Like, if you went 50 years ago, you didn't have many options nope. either about picking your job, picking your spouse, picking what you would do on the weekend, you didn't have a lot of options. So you just stuck with those two or three options that were put in front of you and you chose one of them and that's it. But now we have so many options. You can just get your phone and have millions of options, literally with a YouTube or any other social media or any other site or whatever the hell you want. So it's really hard. And like you were saying, Okay, you start with something for one week, for two weeks, one month. But then you see a lot of people saying, well, maybe you should try this because this is the great thing now. This is the next great AI site or whatever it is. And then you're like, okay, so let me try this. And then when you see you go this other way and you forgot that first thing. And eventually, if you look back, at the 52 weeks of that year, every week you were trying something. So yeah. it's like the vectors, each of the vectors for your actions go one place and you didn't get out of, like you didn't go anywhere. You're just, no. you take a step here and then one here and then one here and you're not doing anything. Like you have this illusion that you're learning. You have this mm-hmm. illusion that you're going somewhere, but actually you're kind of staying in the same place. So it's hard. Yeah. It, it is hard. And what I realized the hard way is I remember uh, 2017 was one of those years for me. That was the year after I, I left the U.S. military. And that year I was just, you know, I was going through the all the struggles, you know, like identity struggles, career struggles, relationship struggles. I had moved to a new place. I'd never lived there before. It was a really tough time in my life, probably one of the hardest I've had as an adult. Because there's nobody, you know, I'm past that age where people are going to figure it out for you. You know, you mm-hmm. had to figure it out for yourself do you, like, and really decide, do you want this relationship? Do you want this life that you're headed into? And nobody's going to give you the answers. And I remember watching a lot of YouTube that year. But I consider it, I look back, it, it's like a lost year. Because exactly what you said, like I was going down all these different rabbit, rabbit holes. At the time, I was teaching myself Spanish. I was really trying to become a Spanish court interpreter. Um, I did learn Spanish in the end, but I I didn't become a court interpreter. And I think that's not the worst part of that story, though. The worst part is that, just like you said, like I was hopping between so many different things. I'm like, is this going to be the next thing? Is this going to be the thing that makes me feel secure, that solves my problems? Of course, none of them were. And I got out of that year thinking like, wow, I feel like this was a waste Um, developmentally, right? I grew in other areas of my life, but as far as like that time, all those hours that I spent on YouTube thinking that I was learning something and, and moving towards some type of goal, I was resetting every time. And, and that's the lesson that I had to learn the hard way is that every time you start a new program even within like you know let's let's continue with the the portuguese example even in that domain like i talked about all these examples right there's travel videos there's videos that are portuguese adjacent but you're not they're not helping you learn the language like at at least Mm -hmm. at the level that you should be and part of you knows this but every time you change tracks so to speak or oh this program that program you reset it you're starting over and I forget where I got this. I got this from one of these, you know, it was one of these X newsletters that I was on last year. And, oh, it, this was from Nicholas Cole. It's basically like, yeah, he said this within the writing context. Like every time you change, he was talking about niches with writing. So if you write fantasy, 
and then your next book is historical fiction, you've started over because mm -hmm. you've got to learn how to write historical fiction and you wrote fantasy. Same with me. I wrote what I call military game tech fiction, which is basically like military science, science fiction for my first novel. And then I write supernatural horror. Well, that's, that was a four month learning curve that I set myself self up for. And so it's fine to do this because of course, as you level up in each, with each thing, you're going to find ways to integrate the two. Like it's still writing at the end of the day, but then there's different expectations for different niches, for different genres, for different stories. And you've got to learn what those are. You don't know what those are. And it's the same with any domain. If you're a chef, you know, like if you go from being a, a at, working at a barbecue joint to working at a sushi joint, it's still cooking, but you're cooking completely different things in different ways. And so that's a learning curve. I'm not saying don't do this. I mean, I'm, I'm the, I don't want to say I'm the king of synthesis, but I do a lot of synthesis in my work. I combine languages. I combine cultures. I combine a lot of ideas in my writing and my stories and the way I think about things. This is the way I just, I see the world. I, I see blends, you know, hell, I'm talking to you. <laughs> American, Brazilian, you know, this kind of connection, right? You know, it's, it's, I see that blend every day. That's just kind of my lens for the world. So I like to include that in my art, but I'm saying do it consciously. I'm saying when you switch to something, know that you are switching. And if you have no experience in what you're switching to, know that you are starting over. And if you ever plan to, to actually do what you're switching to well, or especially if you plan on like making a business out of it or turning into a career or getting a job, then you should know that a lot of the stuff that you learned in domain A will not transfer to domain B. You are starting over. Get that in your mindset to where, okay, start your, begin from that beginner's mindset. And that's why I started this talk with the beginner's mindset of being comfortable with that. Because I'd say, I'd argue that most people are not. They're, most people are not comfortable looking like a fool, looking like an amateur. This happened to me last night, actually. I'm in this writing school. You know, I was talking about this writing school. And somebody had posted about, hey, I'm I'm looking, I got my writing and I'm looking to share snippets on social media. You know, anybody have any advice? What should I use? Canva, Photoshop, et cetera. So I get on there and said, I've been doing this for a few years, sharing my stuff. Here's one way you can do it. And I've shown an example of a recent one that I did. Just this line from my, you've probably seen my post, a line from my novel, a picture, Boom. That's basically what I post. And somebody comments, it was like, was like, that looks so amateur. Like that oh. you can barely read it. Yeah. Yeah. He totally slammed my stuff. And I, I was like, you know, given the context of where this person was coming from, I could see where he, he had this mindset. He had tried some social media stuff before it hadn't worked. And like a lot of people, he said, fuck it. It doesn't work. Yeah. Just Nobody give up reads after online. one or two. Times. Right. It was, it was a single rep. Yeah. And so I already knew the headspace that this guy was in and kind of his mentality. So I didn't really take his, his, his criticism with any weight because I was like, you, you haven't been in, in the arena, man. I've been doing this for several years now. Like, look at my, my ex. I got 10,000 reps of this, not just this, but of putting my, my ass out there and looking half of those. I didn't know what I was doing. And I bring up that story because most people would feel uncomfortable. Most people would get even more offended. Like I was, I'm not going to say I wasn't a little bit tilted by his comment, but I took it like, yeah, I am an amateur. I never claimed to be an expert in this. I'm just saying I've done it a lot. And th here's what I see works. I feel like most people like this, this guy clearly had a problem with looking like, because he came back later and was like, I said, it's, it's amateur or not. This is what works on social. I'm just telling you. I didn't really clap back at him. That was my only response. And then he was like, no, it's not about that. You don't want to be associated with poor quality. And I mm. was like, no beginner's mindset. How can you ever start if you don't risk looking like a fool? And I'm not talking looking like a fool in the mirror. Everybody, you know, you can do that to yourself all day and nobody will care. But this is assuming that you want people to read your writing, to listen to your music, to 
appreciate your art, whatever you're doing, then you have to take that step of looking like an idiot or looking you like do, an amateur. You or put else you will never there. get to the mastery stage. You will never. And look at, I don't care, pick any example of anybody who's top in their field. Taylor Swift, Tom Cruise, uh, Oprah, whatever. Pick any celebrity, any well-known celebrity. Rewind the clock 20 years. Look at their first stuff. Case in point. That's it. You know, it, it it's not the best stuff. You know, it's it's not. But how long have they been doing it? Look at this time horizon. We're talking 20 years. I could go back further with some celebrities. I mean, hell, Tom Cruise, you go back 40 years. But look at that time horizon. And I think this is another problem today. People's time horizons are very short. Yeah. They see virality. They see, you know, people who blow up after supposedly like, oh, he posted one thing and look at this. It's like, do you see the thousands? Mr. Beast, do you see the hundreds of videos that he did that was just him sitting in his dorm room? Like, did you not see these? Like, of course you did. Nobody was watching him at this time. And so that type of, I, I bring all this up to go back to, this is probably, maybe this is the theme of the, our talk today, but that beginner's mindset. If you're not willing to put your ass on the line in the beginning and take the blows and take, you know, people calling you amateur, that type of shit, you know, and, and I've had it before. I've had, I get ignored daily on social media. This is something that you and I, you get used to after a while. It doesn't feel good, you know, to spend 30 minutes, an hour into a post thinking about it or making graphics or making a video and have nobody, you know, you get like 20 impressions or something. Yeah. And no one probably watched the video. A couple you likes. Get, you get no videos. You get no comments. Um, or worse, you get bot comments. That's what I've seen more lately. More bots coming on. Like, and it's like, you think it's a real person and it's like, it's not even clearly a bot. And it's like, damn, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I put, you know, you put effort into everything that you do. And then it, this is the response, you know, that's a daily thing. And you have to get used to that if you ever want to make it to somewhere beyond where you are. I, I don't know. Maybe that's Hollywood stardom. Maybe that's a, a movie deal, whatever. Everybody has a different goal for the what the what the dream is but even if it's just to make a comfortable living from doing your art or doing your work or your business you damn well better get comfortable with getting ignored with having people naysay your stuff and whatever because there's no other way to get through yeah and even people around you people close to you they might not believe yeah. in you in the beginning and you need to prove them wrong sometimes. You do, man. Those are the hardest ones too. That I think when I started, that was the biggest blow for me was that the people that I was closest to didn't really care. And, and, and if you think about it, they're the hardest ones to convince because they see you a certain way. Like everybody saw me as Keith, the military guy. Like that from almost my entire life before five, six years ago, that's how my family and friends thought of me. I mean, most of my network is still in the military. So it's like, they're like, writing novels? Like, what? You know, like, it, it's, it takes, it's like their picture of you has become a statue. And they are not willing to take that statue down so easily. Because that's all they know yeah. about you. So to erect a new statue, you've literally got to hand chis chisel it and show it to them that's you got those are two things hand chisel it that that is the equivalent of working on your art or working on your whatever you're doing and then it's showing it to them regularly to remind them hey this is what i'm doing hey hey just gonna tell you it's not that old statue you got to take that shit down this is the new one and you got to do that and do that and do that and do that it's going to take years it is man i I've, I've only had i only recently have i had the closest people in my life start to really be like, okay, I believe you. I believe you. And that's just saying, I believe you. That's not buying your shit. That's surely not championing your shit. I haven't even really gotten past that threshold yet of them. Like, I believe you and I'm going to support you. 
support comes in different forms, but support in the way we want it as artists, which tends to be either appreciation or monetary compensation, like people actually paying you for your effort. Those are those are tiers, those are levels to this game that I haven't even surpassed yet. And I've been in the game active for seven years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want to go back to, to that beginning part, yeah. but just to comment, you know, there's that saying in the Bible, and I'm not much of a religi religious guy or anything, hmm. but it's something like you can't be a prophet in your own hometown or something like that. Ah, I like that. I and, like you that. know, about that journey as well, I think in general from the closest people to me, like my parents, my uncles, and that kind of thing, they usually are very encouraging, but at the same time, they're not really my target audience. Right. So like yeah. you were saying, it's hard for you to get people to buy your stuff because they're probably not the the audience that would buy, you know? So I think right. even when you're lucky enough that people are encouraging and they're like, yeah, it's awesome that you're trying. It's awesome that you're doing that stuff. Even then, they might not be the ones who will be the ones who will buy, who you will be able to sell to that right. you can make a business out of because it's not like the target audience. Right. Yeah. I've had that too. They're supportive of the effort, but exactly that. Like the story is exactly what I'm writing about. And like, especially now, right? Writing supernatural horror. My mom was one of my biggest fans of my first book, but this book, <laughs> she said, absolutely not. No. And same with my wife. Like, they just don't. Horror is, I've noticed horror tends to be one of those genres that it's love or hate. People either really, really love it, or it's like, I won't even touch it. I won't watch. I won't read. I don't want to think about that. And I could totally understand. Because it's taken me some time to get, and I've commented on this a couple of times, how I'm, I'm uh, by nature, I'm a lousy horror writer. I, I feel like, you know, you think about like the the famous horror writers, right? Like Stephen King, Lovecraft, Poe. There's a darkness there. Yeah. Like it, a, a, a visible darkness. Like you can just read a bio of their life and be like, you know, like when I read Stephen King's on writing earlier this year, I was like, I didn't know he was such a drunk. Like he yeah. was a terrible drunk. Like And a drug addict. And a drug addict, and a drug addict. And I was like, whoa, I did not, you know, he's since gotten clean for a long time, but I didn't know that. And I feel like there's something like that in most famous horror writers' lives. I, I, I can't say that I have that. I, I can't say that I have that worldview. Um, I definitely don't have any level of, of trauma. You know, I, I've gone through shit in my life, but... Not like that, to where it's like, that's where I sit. That's my headspace. And I feel like people who regularly write and consume horror, there's something there, whether they know it or not. And so it's interesting being kind of a guest in this horror space. In the, you know, you write a horror novel for six months. You learn some things about how you think about it. And actually, I got this from... Um, I've been doing the AI deep dives with my chapter. So this is part of my process. We were going to talk about this later, but essentially I write a chapter and I feed it to Google Notebooks, LM, AI, which if listeners don't know what Notebook LM does is it allows people to basically take a document and research it and do commentary. You can do outlines, you can do briefs. The main use of it is for like research papers that are like, 30, 50 pages thick, and you're like, whoa, how am I going to absorb this? <laughs> what, the, what the fuck's the point of this? Then it will extract, like, the meaning of it. I use it for fiction. And for fiction, it's very interesting because what it does is it basically produces outputs that is like extra eyes on your story. So it the big feature, the killer feature that everybody's talking about is the deep dive podcast like audio rendering that it creates from the documents that you feed it and you can feed it 
websites, you can feed it text, you can feed it PDFs, and it will take all of these things and it will extract meaning from it. And then the AI will actually manifest into NPR-like voices talking about those things. It's, un it's, it's fucking uncanny. If you haven't tried it, you should definitely try it after you listen and watch this video. Yeah, I'm getting a bit of FOMO now. You haven't tried it? No. No. Oh, man. It's so, I mean, it, this is just my use case, right? So anyway, with this AI, I've been feeding my chapters. And what it does is sometimes it's very on the nose. It's kind of bland. But sometimes it's like two really smart people reading your work. And I feed it a chapter at a time. And in one of these recent ones that I did, I think it was the one I did maybe two nights ago, it was like the woman was like, there's a man and a woman, and the woman was like, Keith's exploring this horror, these dark sides of ourselves. He's creating a playground to where we can think about these dark aspects of humanity, but it's basically a contained space for the dark aspects of humanity. So when you leave that space... Hopefully you either appreciate the lighter sides or you're more sensitive to the lighter sides or you understand the potential darkness that dwells within you if it resonated, if certain parts of it resonate, certain images in the story. And I really liked that. I think that that sums up how I feel about horror, like writing horror, because I know like I, I haven't this is the first time this is an exclusive. This is a. A gay podcast exclusive. I've never talked about this before openly, but I think it's true because I, I think if people like liked my first novel, which had nothing to do with horror, and then like, why is he writing horror? You know, like, first of all, it's more about the story that I wanted to tell. I was living in Okinawa when I started writing it. I wanted to write a story that involved Japanese folklore. There's a lot of demons. There's a lot of haunted places in Okinawa. It's a big part of the culture. And so I wanted to integrate that into a story. So I didn't set out to let me write this horror book. It was basically like, this is the subject material. What genre fits best with this story? Happened to be horror. So that's how, it, that's how it happened. And then it's like, okay, now, you know, you start going through the process of how do I actually write this well? How do I actually um, give horror fans the expectations and some of the things that they expect in horror. How do you translate? Because I feel like most people, when they think of horror, they think of movies, of course, you know. How do you translate that to the page? How do you make it scary? Scary isn't the right word. I kept thinking scary, scary, scary when I started, but it's really more of a tension, and all stories have tension. Horror has a different style of tension. I think of it like in music, and music... In a lot of like score music and more like cinematic type music, they have this thing called a pedal tone. And mm -hmm. a pedal tone is basically like a sustained note throughout the throughout the piece. And I feel like that's what horror has. Horror always has, whereas like in a drama or any other type of story, there's, you know, obvious peaks and valleys of okay, now it's really tense drama and now, you know, oh it's a lighter moment, whatever. I'm not saying my book doesn't have that. Horror stories have that too, but less so. It kind of stays around the same wavelength of, okay, this is, uh, I, ugh, I don't know. And you get that effect from certain images, from characters, and the type of horror that you're doing, whether you're doing slasher, whether you're doing suspense, you're doing some type of cult. They all have their staples, but they all share that common thread of there's there's got to be that level of, I don't know. I, I really don't know. And I'm kind of afraid to find out. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep reading. I'm going to keep watching. That's how you're doing horror right. Like at its essence, I think. And this is coming from an, a horror amateur. So <laughs> take, take yeah, it with a grain of salt. But. I think with horror, you need to let the reader or the, the audience in the movie kind of imagine things as well. You can't just mm. give them everything. Right, because yes. that tension. I think a great part of what makes you scared with horror or with what makes you tense is what you're imagining, actually, not what you're actually seeing or reading. Right. So you need to kind of leave a little bit to the imagination, so that maybe 
in their minds, it's even worse than the writer fought about, you know? Right, exactly. And I had this happen, actually. I did a I did a short story just last week. And, you know, it's election time over here in the U.S. So I, I called it The Vote. And it's like kind of this dark play on the vote, but it's set in Okinawa. And somebody commented that it was scary, scarier because... I used I used Japanese in the story, and I use words of Japanese to mainly because I like writing in Japanese. But then it adds to this immersion of the story. And somebody commented like it was scarier because I didn't understand the Japanese as I was reading it, and I hadn't thought of that effect because obviously I know a good amount of Japanese, but I hadn't thought of that as like a horror device like language i've never seen that used in a book before i'm sure it has been i'm not saying it hasn't been but i I, i've never seen that to where it's a consistent maybe there's a few like you know last you know some type of alien language or something like that but it's not a consistent motif in the book to where okay this language is is a is a mechanic to disorient you because all of a sudden and I and I could see that, right? You're reading, and then all of a sudden, you're like, "What's going to happen? What's going to happen?" It's like Japanese word, like, oh, shit, man, "What the fuck? What the fuck? Where did that come from?" And then it goes back into English. I, I haven't. I could see how it could re like add to that disorientation and add to that tension, right? Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, a good. Mechanic. Yeah, it's a good plot yeah. mechanic to use. And since we're going more into the rabbit hole of Gates of Okinawa and what made you write it in the first place? Yeah. Um, how was the process from that first idea that you had? Because as you said, there's a lot of haunted houses and ghosts and a lot of things like that in Okinawan culture. And you lived in Okinawa up to recently, actually. Like mm-hmm. you've just gone back to the U.S. Yeah. And how was it like? When you decided I want to write about this and and coming up with a plan or and how am I going to write this? How am I going to transform this into a book and actually organizing yourself to write it as well? And, you know, from the, the eyes of a writer, of a novelist, how is it like because looking well, as the reader or as someone who never did this, we have no idea. Like how does yeah. a novelist, how is the process? Well, this process already it, it already started out different than most of my projects because it was an it was an experiment from the jump. I had visited a library in Okinawa, a very small one, and I saw the James Patterson section. There is the obligatory James Patterson section in any library in any bookstore just because he's he's put out so many damn books. And so I passed by this section and I was like I'd recently listened to a podcast about how he writes. And if you don't know his writing process in brief, it's basically he does like drafts. He used to write all of his books. It's been a long time since he has. He writes basically outlines and then he has like ghost writers, other more well-known writers write the stories for him. This has been part of his formula. But what a lot of people don't know is that James Patterson started out in advertising. He was a, he was a marketer like an old school from the 1970s. And that was his his kind of education coming up. So he wanted to apply the marketing models that he knew so well to fiction because he did like fiction. And so he basically came up with like this kind of factory type way to produce books very fast, but of reasonably high quality. And this helped him produce very fast and higher quality books, and he's had several famous books. So as I was passing through the section, I was thinking about all this, and I was like, well, we've got AI tools now. And I had been experimenting with writing fiction with AI for most of the early half of this year. I had written a lot of microfiction. I wrote some shorter stories. I used it for a lot of things. So I felt like I had put it through its paces, and I was confident enough that I knew how to, to use the technology to help me write a James Patterson-esque book with that mentality, right? Write it fast, put it out, make it genre fiction. Don't think too hard about it. Just put it out. 
And so that was the plan, actually. The plan, That's this is how this idea started, right? And if you go back, and now I have this kind of uh, collection of all of my, the the initial conception of this novel is actually recorded. This is probably, this might, hell, I just thought of this. This might be a Guinness World Record of the most well-documented novel writing process of all time. Mm -hmm. It could be. Because I've got videos, I've got podcasts for the past six months of me writing this novel. And I have the day one video of me sitting down and saying, I'm going to write this novel. And I'm going to do it by the end of the day. I said, I said, I said, and then I changed it to, okay, let me, by the end of the month, I can get it done. I did not finish by the end of the month. Clearly. But this, you talked, you asked about how do you, how did you start? How did this come up? I mean, I basically have, because I've written enough long form fiction to, I do have a process to how I think about it, but technology like AI has made it much faster to move through those initial stages. So all novels start with an idea, a single idea, you know, like this concept, you know, it's like growing a tree. It doesn't grow overnight. It takes a long time to germinate, to develop, and then to finally see something that you can actually want to have a picnic under and that will actually mm -hmm. give you shade and do tree things. For a long time, the novel doesn't really do anything. It doesn't look like anything. And so those early days are the initial seeds of start out with your idea. What do you want to say? Gates of Okinawa actually started out as like an alien fiction because I was thinking like, oh, the demons are like aliens and they're invading Okinawa. That that was my initial type of thought process. So I used my, I have a story generator that I created that I coded myself and I just used that, man. I punched that in to give me an idea. And what the story generator does is it basically generates like seeds of story ideas. It gives you like a a typical plot archetype. It gives you like what type of ending doesn't have. And then you can generate a character as well. So I did exactly that. And you can see these videos. I love that I documented this because you can actually see me doing this in real time, taking information from that. And then, but it's not, and, and this is what, you know, a lot of the AI haters who maybe have already shut off this video because I talked about writing with AI. Well, good. Well, fuck you. Go, <laughs> go listen to something else. Go watch something else. But to those who are willing to listen, this is the process of, of writing with technology. And this is why I call myself a digital novelist, because it becomes this kind of symbiosis of ideas to where I'm not just taking what the AI gives me. I'm not just taking what my generator, which has no AI in it, by the way, it's all just like arrays, Python and shit. But I'm not just taking that and stuffing it into a story and, or stuffing it into ChatGPT and saying, write this for me. Like, I trust me, I tried that. It doesn't work very well. What I am doing is throughout the way, I'm inserting my own intuition and saying, like, what does this kind of want to be? Because at the end of the day, ChatGPT can't do anything for you. You you have to make the decisions of what you're going to pull out. Even if what you're going to pull out is an entire chapter, you have to decide that. Like, there's no fully AI produced anything because there's always, a, right now at least, there's always a human that's like curating that and saying, is this what I really want? Or do I want to tweak this? Do I want to change this? Everybody who seriously uses AI does this in their creative process. I do it too. And so that's how it started. I would pull things and I would be like, this kind of works. I like this for the main character. I like, I don't like that. And then a little bit at a time, chapter one, let's go. Chapter two, let's go. And putting it in, really, it's ideas. And I just talked about this on an episode of my podcast, the Digital Novelist podcast. What AI allows has allowed me to do is really focus on my, I focus on my ideas, and leave more of the development of those ideas to AI, but not completely, because I still do a lot of writing. Like I mentioned before, we started we started recording. I'm probably writing like three hours a day. Wow. Fiction, either new stuff or um, revising or editing my old manuscript at least three hours. And that is part of my process. It's 
it's go in manually either write a brand new chapter or manually revise the existing chapter, then feed it to the AI, see what the AI is seeing that I'm not. Cause, and sometimes it's great at seeing like, this is a little bit repetitive. This would add a little bit more tension there. This would do this. Sometimes it's really bad. Like typically with humor stuff, nah. It, it thinks it knows what humor is, but I, I, anytime it, it says something about humor, I'm like, okay, nah. just, shut, just shut the fuck up. Like, you really don't know what you're talking about. I know I know what's funny, right? I'm no comedian, but I'm saying, like, I know more what's funny than the damn computer, right? But it does come up with good things, and then it's not just copy and pasting what it gives me, because it will give you, like, you should do this, and then here's an example snippet based on what I wrote. And I love this part of it because... It's basically like it's become like an editor, a very customized mm -hmm. editor that is taking what you wrote and saying, here's how you could tweak it to make it better. This is something that a good editor would do. Right. And so I'm getting that from the AI and then it's incorporating like going almost line by line to hell, sometimes word by word and saying, I like this word that you wrote. Better than what I wrote. I like what I wrote better than what you wrote. Now I want to combine the two to make it stronger. And I do this daily. And that's that's the process, man. So it's the symbiosis when you really start working. But yeah, long answer to your question of it's a you know, and yeah, I'll say this because we weren't recording earlier, but it's a discipline, you know, um, of really doing it to the only way to actually finish and get it out. I feel like a lot of authors don't really make it to that second half. They finish the novel, some, but not a lot of people finish the novel. So if they do finish, getting to the release phase is something that a lot of them don't make it to. Why? Because it's hard. You have to go back and look at what you wrote and be like, uh, this isn't, it's either not good or it's not the best that it could be. And that's already a blow because you're thinking it was hard enough just to get this first thing down and get the clarity and get the, get in the mindset to get this down. I know how hard that is. But now you've got to rip it apart. First, you've got to rip it apart yourself. And then whether you're using AI or you have an editor, somebody else is going to rip it apart. Or if you just decide to publish it, then you take the chance of somebody who reads it ripping it apart. So either way, mm -hmm. somebody that's not you is going to read this. If, you know, you're, if you're writing for yourself, then ignore all of this. But if you're writing like a lot of writers who want to get read, you're a fiction writer and you want to get read, then you've got to hear this somebody is going to rip your shit up. They're not going to see it the same way as you. And let me argue that that's a good thing. That's what good art is. It's interpretive. Gabe, the way you read my book should not be the way I wrote it. It's not going to be. I mean, that's the great thing about art is that it, it transfers some meaning. Some things are very obvious, but some things aren't. Some things are, are going to look different to different people. That And that you have to let it go. And I feel like that's where a lot of fiction writers struggle. They're, they're too, ooh, this is my story. And if you don't, if you don't read it, like it the way I do and love it the way I do, then you can go suck an egg, whatever. You know, like they do that type of thing. <laughs> and it's like, I feel you. I understand how hard it is to to let go of something that you put so much time and thought and energy and effort into. I mean, hell, I've been, I don't know how many hours I've been working on Gates of Okinawa, but it's at least, it, it's a thousand plus at this point. I mean, just, it, it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of time. And it, it does, you know, you feel some type of weight when somebody ignores it, when somebody rejects it, you put this effort into all this stuff. But at the same time, I'm like, that's, that's going to happen. There's a lot of choice out there and people make choices about wh how they're going to spend their time daily. And mine is an option among those choices. But when somebody does take the time to consume it, who, who am I to tell them how to like it? That, is, that defeats the purpose of, of letting the art speak for itself. Like you have to have confidence that what you put out can speak for itself. Like I don't have to stand there and defend it every time. If you grab a copy, I'm not going to be over your shoulder. Oh, did you see that metaphor? Mm -hmm. <laughs> did you see that character yeah. did you see what they did there <laughs> put some notes under an ace like 
this is exactly how you should feel when you read this. Like, what uh, yeah. the fuck is that? Like, that, that sounds horrible. I mean, and nobody really wants that. It's, I'm, I'm speaking in extremes, but it, I mean, would you feel better if that is? I think most artists, true artists, would not feel better if that is what they were going for. It's very prescriptive. You know, this is how you should feel. Like, no, there should be a ballpark, of course. If you're feeling happy all the time and I wrote a horror novel, then shit, I fucked up. I didn't write a horror novel. <laughs> But at the same time, the, if they're getting, it, you know, if they're having some type of reaction, and, and we mentioned this yesterday, I'll mention this um, today, you know, if you're, if you're in the business of B2B, you're selling solutions. If you're B2C, as in selling to people, you sell emotions. Let that sink in. I, I had to think about that when I read it a couple of times, but it's true. If some and I think about that every day. I feel like I did a good job as a as a storyteller and as a novelist. If somebody felt something when they read my work, that's a success. You move somebody from one emotional state to another. You got to think about that. That's a powerful thing. Only stories can do that. Not only stories, but stories tend to be a huge driver of that change. And you are driving that change as a as a fiction writer. It's a powerful, powerful thing. Yeah, I'd argue that even in B2B, you kind of have to evoke some emotion as well. You because do. Because at the end of the day, people buy from people. And even if you're trying to be completely rational, at the end of the day, there are just certain aspects of the human psyche that you can't no. control. And, you know, sometimes if you're buying from someone you like, it might be... There might be a, another solution that's just a little bit better or they're mm -hmm. kind of equivalent and then you go with your friend just because you yep. kind of like him. Exactly. That's the way it goes. But And also when you were talking about being an artist and putting art out there and I think good art always has a lot of layers. So mm -hmm. yes, that's one of the reasons that people have different interpretations and sometimes the artist puts those layers on purpose. Sometimes... It's not really on purpose. Sometimes totally we're unconscious. That, yeah, totally unconscious. Because as you were saying also before, like there's this book from Rick Rubin and mm -hmm. and you're kind of, nobody really knows where creativity comes from. Yes. So you don't really know where ideas come from. If it's something deep inside our subconscious, deep inside our brain, or if really we're kind of antennas that, you know, get that from the, I, I don't know how they call it, but you know, that superhuman kind mm. of web that connects all of us, you yeah. know, there from are some the people that believe in that. Yeah. yeah from the ether. Like that. Yeah. For sure. So yeah, it, it's very interesting to think about all of that and to think about, you know, one thing that I was thinking of asking you when you were talking about this, do you think you are born an artist or that you become an artist? I've struggled with the word artist for a long time. By the way, that book is called The Creative Act. And yeah, you should go check it out. It's a very short read. And I, it really, I don't know, it just reaffirmed a lot of the things that I felt intuitively as a writer and whatever, even if you're not a writer, uh, if you're some type of creator, and I, I suggest you check it out. Um, your question what was the question sorry if you're born an artist or if you uh, become an artist if you're born an artist or you become... okay so i struggled with the artist label for a while and let me tell you why because when i was a kid i i did a lot of creative stuff i, I started with legos uh, me and my brothers had this huge lego town i think i talked about that last time we talked but yeah, we played Legos all the time. Of course, video games. Um, then as I got older, we got like, I remember one year we got this camcorder. And it was one of those giant 90s ones, you know, like you did the, the, the VHS tape in. Uh, and yeah, I, I started like making like mini movies and stuff. Did some stop motion things. Like to me, whenever I heard the, art, the word artist, I, it, it implied like some type of lifestyle and like intent or something, you know, and I think of these, these images of these old cartoons where you've got the, 
the the painter and the floppy hat and he's got the easel <laughs> and you know he's just kind of on the side of the street and, you know that, that was when i think of artists like when i was younger that's what i thought of i thought of like there's you know you have this get up and you have your tools or whatever you're maybe you're a sculptor or maybe you're a writer or whatever and you have your tools you have your typewriter you know this kind of old school so thinking of myself as an artist you know i think we all have it in us we all definitely have creativity in in us but it's what you choose to do with it and if you let it allow it to to come out of you that really determines if you're an artist and then there's the allowing and then there's the shaping because I'd argue that most people especially as you you know age up and become an adult and as you get older you tend to that creative side tends to get buried by the demands of the world um, by the expectations going back to the beginning of this talk you know like beginner mindset you know looking a fool going you know there was a time earlier this year probably actually when I was moving, it was a couple of months ago that I was doing sketching, hand drawing. Cause you know, a lot of people are doing AI images and things like that, but that actually inspired me to go a hand of drawing. And so I was getting decent, but you know, obviously I, I hadn't really put a lot of effort into drawing by hand sketching. So a lot of my early sketches sucked. <laughs> We're good. And you know, we already talked about, you know, being willing to have that, that creative mindset, but that's been in me, but it's giving it form, giving it structure, giving it, putting discipline and intent behind it, intent. That's a big difference of being an artist. So I feel like anybody can become an artist anytime. I don't think it's a born, I do, I feel like some people are, are more sensitive to art at a younger age. And then of course you have the environment, right? Think of like a lot of celebrities, kids, why do they go on to be singers, rappers, actors like their parents. So because their parents are a fucking singer, rapper, actor. I mean, it's pretty easy when you grow up in that environment, you already have the connections. You have somebody who knows how to do it, who can train you and teach you and shape your creativity from a very young age. I'd argue that's not most people. Most people, it, it's haphazard. That's the way it was for me. Like there was no, you know, you have the standard curriculum of, of art classes and, you know, you play with blocks, you play with Legos. Then maybe I was also on my high school robotics team. I did that. That was another um, thing that I did when I was younger. It, also a very creative type of thing, especially at the time. Robotics wasn't nearly as as advanced, especially high school robotics. This was early 2000s. So it wasn't nearly as much of a thing as it is now. So you have much more things. of a nerd thing. That oh, yeah, yeah, for time, sure. Right? Oh, God, yeah. I was huge nerd. I still am. But yeah, those those robotics things, man. And and I feel I look back on that time and I just look at myself and I just want to I want to slap my 18, 16 year old self because I was in with all these nerds. My friends were so smart and I was there, too. But I was like smart in a different way. But they were like technically smart. Like a lot of my friends went on to become software engineers. One of them went to like petroleum engineering. I'm from Texas in the U.S., so that's a big thing down there. They went on to be, do some type of engineering. A lot of my friends did. And I just had this mindset that I was not a technical guy. I did not like the ins and outs of computers. I didn't really, you know, I would only go on the Internet to, like, do my homework and look up cheat codes to video games. Like, I wasn't really, I just wasn't into it at that age. And I look back at myself, man, like, where I'm at now as much as I've gotten into AI and then learning coding, doing free code camp, things like that, 100 days of code, I'm like, man, I could have done this years ago. I should have done this years ago. I was already there. I went to one of the top engineering schools in the U.S. and I didn't, I didn't really pull on that string. And so I feel like that's a, I don't know, this is one of my list of regrets getting older. But anyway, the artist side of me is like, not, everything kind of was haphazard. I started writing um, my journal after my dad passed away. And I just continued writing. But I didn't think of it as an art. Actually, I was just reading one of my old journals, like from 17 years ago. I was just reading it this morning. And writing is so... It's bad, y'all. 
<laughs> it was bad. But I mean, that's the thing. There was no intent there to be an artist. It was just expression. And I feel like everybody has expression. You know, whether you're just singing in the shower, singing on in your car, on the way to work, or whistling around the house, whatever you do, tapping your foot, that is expression. That is innate in us as humans. But to become an artist, you take that and you give it form. You shape it. You mold it. You train it to where you can do it on command. And hopefully, if you're good enough, you can do it to where other people want to see your you're singing and you're shaking and you're writing whatever you're doing and that's that's what happens that that's how you become an artist i mean it's it's really easy actually when you think about it all it takes is like when i decided to tag myself as the digital novelist that was a one day decision that i was like okay i'm in, this was may this was about 6 months ago around the time that i started writing this novel and i said okay i'm the digital novelist and i want to write novels i want to help people write novels, and I want to focus on writing fiction. That's going to be my main thing. Not to say I can't write nonfiction, because I still do, but that's going to be my main thing that I want to show people, that I want to express to the world. I want to train that. I want to mold it. I have intent. Now I'm an artist. I don't think of it as yeah. this, like, this this foo-foo thing, because I think that's that's where a lot of people get, get caught. And the guy I was telling you about that called my stuff amateur last night. I think he had that because part of his thing was like, you get your writing from the divine and blah, blah, blah. You don't, you know, uh, he was like, stop trying, stop trying to chase, begging people to read your writing and all this stuff. And part of me, this is one of the reasons I didn't clap back because part of me understands that. I, I do feel that way. Like, like we talked about the creative act. There is something that I'm connecting to that, yeah, I see the words on the paper, blah, blah, blah. But there's something about this moment in time being who I am, where I'm at, level of energy, all the factors together that when I sit down and have this intent to write, that's going to show up on the page. And I feel like there's this, and I've seen this movement now, especially with AI, to really intellectualize writing, to really, you know, break it down into, oh, you can do this with AI, just put this piece this together. I'm fine with that. You could totally do that. But what I found is that it's less organic then if you write messy first, if you just be that conduit, let it flow through you, even if it doesn't look right on the page, even if it sucks, and then you can do that on the back end. You can do that. Instead of trying to piece these things together, That's it's it's possible, but it's a, I should say it's a different way of creating because I've tried it that way, and it's it doesn't mean you're not an artist. It just means you're creating with different tools. And this is the whole AI debate. AI is not art, blah, blah, blah. It's soulless. It can be soulless. It absolutely can be. You and I, I'm sure you've seen examples of soulless mm -hmm. AI work. I've seen it. But it, it can also have soul too. It can also be infused with it depending on how you're using it and depending on the intent of how you're using it. Not just copying, pasting, not just... You know, make me a Rembrandt, make me a Mona Lisa, whatever, you know, not just taking existing work and like copying it, but like remixing and adding to your own ideas. That's how you can become the artist. So many interesting points, man. Yeah. Like you said about the Mona Lisa, and I was thinking about some other artists as well. Like it's easy to look at the Mona Lisa and say, wow, Da Vinci was such a beast he was such a great artist yeah or to look at any masterpiece really because that's the thing that many people get wrong mm. we look at someone's masterpiece and then we think like it's like that's the only thing they ever did you know right. you look at at michael jackson's thriller and you're mm. like that's a fucking masterpiece but right. how many years that he put into his music before that since oh he was a little God. kid yeah and it was 20 how years many yeah. yeah, how many paintings Picasso did before the ones that got famous, you know? Mm -hmm. How many sketches, how many drawings? And you need to be willing to to do shit that's terrible, frankly. Like, the first drawing you ever do won't be good. Even yeah. if you have a bit of, you know, I think you do have natural talents as well. So yep. even if the person, they have this natural, good singing voice, 
but you still have to learn how to sing properly mm -hmm. and how to use that for it's like um yeah of course like an instrument but also it's like a tool that you have to learn how to use it's like when you first learn to drive a car you yep. need to learn how to use that car the best way possible and the same thing goes with all of your talents and absolutely yeah there were so many great things you talked about in that that <laughs> sorry I, I just man. get i just go I, I just go off but when you said no like, but i don't want to to interrupt you when you're going off because there were so many valuable things <laughs> no i when when you mentioned that you have to refine things i, I thought of myself in public speaking um it was just a, a few weeks ago that I tried to, when I joined the writing school, actually, so it was last week, because people were talking about basically one of the guy, the guy who runs the school is basically like, hey, I used to be a bad speaker, but then I made like 200,000 YouTube videos over many years, and now I've gotten mm -hmm. better. And public speaking was one of those things that I felt like, I feel like I had natural talent at when I was a kid. I just didn't mind getting up in front of people. And it was funny because... <laughs> You ask my mom, and she'll tell you, man, he was when I was a kid, I was so quiet. But if you got me in front of like the right people, like my friends, or even like a classroom when I was like middle school and under, I was man, I, I could bust it out. I would do it. But then I went through this period where it was probably shortly after college. Actually, it started happening at the very end of college, to where I would start getting nervous. Like I felt like I was kind of falling off. And what was happening? Well, what it was, was that I had been writing on raw talent my entire life up to that point. Mm -hmm. I had never really thought about it. It was just like, okay, I feel good about this. And then all of a sudden, as the stakes got higher, right? You know, like I, I went to a military school. So you're trained to become a military officer in the U.S. military. And so as, you know, things got more important and it's like, oh, holy shit, like I really need to do this right. I need to prepare. Like that was another thing that I didn't really do when I was younger. I didn't really prepare for for presentations and shit. I would just get up and Keith, your turn. OK, then I go up and do it. And high school, easy. I would do that. Never had a problem. But then college, as things started getting tougher and I had to like actually prepare in domains I, I didn't really know I wasn't comfortable in, I started having a problem. And I remember when I was in the military, I had this panic attack and I never really told anybody about it, but I was just like freaking out at, I forget what the circumstances were, but it was at this point where I had to, um, oh, that's what it was. This is going to sound so weird, but I was a cop in the military and I had to do a rights advisement. This was part of, um, if you're doing a subject interview of, of a potential, somebody's potentially committed a crime. You got to advise them of their rights. You have a right to remain silent. You've heard it a million times in the movie and TVs. So I, I was doing that. And I just freaked out. Like, I don't know what it was. I got through it, but I, I I was shaking. Like, I just didn't feel right. And I don't think my coworker noticed. But it was just, it was a turning point for me that I need help with this. Like, I'm not so as good as I thought I was. And so I did. That was the first year. This was about 10 years ago. That was the first year that I actually found a public school or public speaking trainer where I was living at and I attended the classes and eventually that led to Toastmasters, which if you don't know what Toastmasters is, public speaking club, highly recommend it if you are struggling with public speaking in any capacity. But yeah, I, I did Toastmasters for several years and I just before I left Okinawa, I was, I was actually the president of a chapter over there. And yeah, this is, and of course I was doing other things as well, you know, doing all this stuff, doing YouTube videos and doing podcasts and just putting myself out there. Um, yeah, I've just gotten a lot better. And so I bring up this, this whole arc of my public speaking to say like, even if you have raw talent in something, just like Gabe, you said, it, it doesn't mean that one, you can't get better from your talent you're just starting from a higher baseline than other people but the person who's grinding who's writing every day who's speaking every day whatever the context they will surpass you even with no talent they just will if they're doing it every day so like don't rest i mean this is what my mom would say but don't rest on your laurels right mm -hmm. 
just because you were gifted with a talent in a particular domain, don't let that be the end of the story because your talent, it will atrophy. You will lose touch with like the times. This happens with a lot of people who get a lot of experience in a certain domain. Like they just kind of lose touch with what's happening on the ground. And all they remember is like the old ways. And we see this a lot now with AI stuff. All they remember is the old ways of how to do stuff, but it's like the old ways have changed or they're just not as relevant anymore. And you should really look into these new ways of way people are creating, the way people are thinking about this stuff. Um, so I had to do the public speaking is one of those domains where I had to, and now I'm, I'm fine with it. You know, I can do stuff like this podcast. I, I do live streams all the time and do podcasts all the time. I just like, I love it. I listen to myself speaking. Like I'd be, I love the sound of my own voice, man. It, it's a <laughs> sickness. I don't listen to my own shit. I was showing my own shit. Like, I just think, I mean, I, I like the sound of my voice. Maybe you hate the sound of my voice. Well, then go listen to something else. But I, they, a lot of people have this problem, right? They don't like the sound of their own voice. And so they're like, ah, I just can't listen to myself. And, and that prevents them from practicing, right? Because that's part of it is listening to yourself and saying, oh, I wasn't very clear there. Or I, I didn't say what I want to say. I didn't communicate how I wanted. And I'm from Texas, y'all, like in the U.S. I have a very, by nature, lazy tongue, like... I just, you know, <laughs> being from the South in the U.S., we all have that. Like, you just have this mash of words. And yeah. what helps you don't even with... sound Texan, man. Oh, I know I don't. Yeah. I don't. I, I definitely, people tag me. It's funny when we travel because even my wife is like, people think I'm like, when they just see me, right? I don't say anything. They're like, they think I'm from the islands. They think I'm from the Caribbean. I've gotten that before. I've gotten African. Um, yeah, I know I don't sound Texan, and it's mainly because, one, I haven't lived there, like, in a long time, but two is because I've really worked on my speech. Like, when I was doing my podcast for my first novel, I listened to those first episodes, and I was like, I just cannot, I am not clear. I am not, I, I need to pull these words apart. So I really worked on that. I really worked on speaking slower, speaking more, more just, like, it, it, we cut off a lot of things down south in the U.S. Like eating stuff, you eating, you know, you you eating today, like yeah, like what is you that type of thing. Like you just it's just the end of the word just falls off. And so I'm like, okay, I'm not saying I like doing like British type pronunciation school, like eating. He is eating over there. Like I'm not doing that type of stuff. But I was deliberate in thinking like, okay, I want to get clearer. I want people to understand and be able to get into the story so learning languages has helped with that doing stuff like you know we we jumped on this with brazilian portuguese talking about how i did some of that just last week um japanese i've learned a lot of languages like to a high level and so doing that really forces me to because you have to put your tongue in all these different shapes that mm -hmm. you're not used to doing in your native language so that is uh is another helpful thing that i've done over the years too yeah, you know, on this debate of talent and effort, it's something that I kind of, I call it the golden boy complex mm. or the golden boy syndrome maybe. Mm. Because if you have a talent in something, you kind of get complacent, you kind of get lazy because you Absolutely. think you'll always rely on the talent. So maybe you're yeah. good at school, maybe you're good at whatever it is. But eventually, you'll find someone that's just as talented as you and someone yeah. who is talented and has also put it on the work so you'll see dude yeah i can't compete like this so no. that's when you like you did with public speaking and that's when you go look for a coach or for a class mm -hmm. or for a, whatever it is or you just try things on yourself to mm -hmm. to improve because you see that talent only goes to a certain extent you right. also have to put in the work and when you make that first step it's a blow man especially if You've been known for a certain talent, especially when yeah. you're younger. Because, you know, when you're younger, you kind of get known for a certain thing. Just from your family, your friends, your environment that you're around. And so when you all of a sudden admit, I, I may, maybe I need a little bit of help with this or I need coaching. It's a blow. I know it was for me. It was like I, I always felt comfortable with this. All of a sudden I don't. And now I'm here in this class with people who are 
some were struggling more, and but some were like higher level. And so it was like, it's a humbling experience to do that. And that goes back to, you know, what we talked about, we started this with that beginner mindset of saying, okay, um, you're not a beginner when you're at that point, but in a way you're starting over because you're getting outside help with something that previously you didn't need any help with, or you thought you didn't need any help with. But, you know, I would say, you know, you think of it as you're, you're going to get better and it, the more you do it, like with Toastmasters, you know, like it took me a couple of years to be able to deliver because Toastmasters is basically centered around all these speeches. You have like a speech curriculum and you give speeches regularly. And then even within the meetings, each role is basically a speech. You will stand up and say, this is my role. I'm the grammarian for tonight. This is what I'm supposed to do. It just gets you comfortable with it starts out with like basically scripted stuff and then eventually you go on to writing your own speeches and delivering them and so it's a it's a really good at stepping you up but even those first few you know how do you handle being given a role that you don't really know how to do well you have to go through that exercise every meeting with Toastmasters so you get comfortable <laughs> with can you just read this on camera or read this in front of people that you don't really know that's the first step. And then the next step is, you know, you step up from there. So having that mindset of, I can get better at this. I know I started with a lot of potential, but this is going to, in the end, give it a month, give it six months. That what we talked about at the beginning, sticking with something, right? Because it, mm -hmm. it's going to hurt. It's going to feel weird and uncomfortable for the first probably month. You're going to be like, I shouldn't be here. Like, I already know this stuff. They're going to be going over the basics, and you're like, I've been knowing the basics. But then I what I do is I look for opportunities to fill in the gaps of my knowledge, and I do this with everything that I know. And I've been in a lot of different domains. If you're listening to this, you haven't, you can't tell. Like, I've done a lot of different things. And if it's something that I know and I'm getting training, I do this all the time with writing. I'm always looking for it because there's so much free shit online. So I'm looking for podcasts, I'm looking for, you know, writers that I see as having tools in their toolkit that I'm like, hey, I want to try that out. I'm listening to that. I'm I'm t filling in these gaps. And yeah, a lot of the stuff, you take it and chunk it. You know, it's like I, I already know that stuff. I know the basics. But then you see how you can strengthen your game from somebody who's got more experience. That's the best mentality to have. Yeah, that's the pro mindset, really. Yeah. I think one thing that is hard is to reconcile. It's like a tension you have between having a long-term vision of where you want to get with something, mm. but also at the same time, you can't really get to that vision now. You have to do all those little steps, and sometimes it's it gets frustrating. Yeah. Like, yeah. like if you're writing a novel, oh, I want to write however many words or pages today mm -hmm. and then you have to write it again and then tomorrow you have to write the same amount and then and then you have to proofread it and edit and do the second draft and yeah. it's the whole process but you have the the book the novel is like the finish line yes but you you have to like reconcile the tension between mm -hmm. what you can do today what you can do now and where you want to get, but like you mm. can't forget about where you want to get. But at the same time, you can't. You kind of need to have your eyes on the prize, but also in each step of the way. You have to kind of block it out. You know, you have to. I know I do. Um, and this is you know we, we, when we started kind of on the call. I was talking about how I'm the ox mindset, right? Of just one step at a time, trudging and just looking at one foot in front of the other day by day, right? Because you're right, the novel, finished novel, the book in my hands, like I want to publish it physically. That's the goal. But if you sit there and think about that every day, then you're going to get overwhelmed. You're, you're not going to be able to take the steps that you need to get the work done today. And the novel and any long-term pursuit, whatever it is, is going to take a multi-day, multi-month effort of, like, consistent effort, too. It's not a half-assed effort. Like, when I sit down and write, it, I have to go all in, you know? 
I have to be there. I have to be willing because I, I see the result when I don't, right? And that's what happened the first half of Gates of Okinawa. I was using the AI to blow through the chapters, but I wasn't really all in. I would be kind of just like rushing. It was, it was, I was still very much in that experimental mindset of experimental writing horror in the first place, but then experimental with the technology and being like, can I do this fast? Which there is a, you know, there is a uh, advantage to working fast. Obviously you just get done faster. Um, but when you're trying to ride that line between producing art, like consumable art that you want people to actually enjoy. And when you're trying to ride that line, then being fast can kind of bite you in the ass. Mm -hmm. Well, that actually rhymes. <laughs> <laughs> but it can. Like, you you just start glossing over things. You're trying. To, there was somebody in the writing group just the other day who was last night, I read. And he was like, yeah, when I revise stuff, I'm just rushing because I feel like I'm I'm writing frustrated. I'm I'm like angry as I'm doing it. And I'm like, bro, don't do that, man. Don't do that to yourself. Like set it aside, go take a walk, get a drink of water, do what you do, and then come back and go through it slow, but don't expect to have all the answers up front. Don't expect to really don't expect to have all the answers ever. Because there's always more that you can do. I guarantee you, you look at a piece of your writing today that you wrote a year ago, you're going to see stuff like, if, you're, if it's not a typo, you're going to see like, that is so corny. Mm -hmm. That is so lame. That is so unclear. Who was I talking about in that sentence? You're going to see all these little things. And that's a good thing. That means you've gotten better. I, I saw that with my first novel. I re I re went through it this summer before I republished it. And it had been three years since I started writing that novel. Well, four years since I started writing it. And I was like, man, this is, that's one of the reasons why I republished it. Because I was like, I just see like where I was unclear, where the, the prose got loose, where I started, you know, just kind of glossing over things and just got kind of lazy with things. And Part of it was ability, right? You know, I was brand new. It was my first novel. You just don't know what you don't know. So, but you have to give yourself time, just like what we talked about, you know, this whole talk is you, you have to let yourself be that because I couldn't have gotten to the four year experienced fiction writer if I hadn't kept writing fiction. If I had just written that novel and done nothing else for the last four years, well, it would just look the same to me. Mm -hmm. But it didn't. Because I kind of had a, a, an increased vision of what it could be. So I redid that and I realized that. But it's having patience with yourself. I think a lot of people are more impatient with themselves nowadays. Because it, like you said in the, at the beginning before we started recording, it's easier to see the examples of the experts, of the masters. You can just go on YouTube. You can just go online and you can see what a good novel looks like and you can compare yourself to that and be like uh why am i why am i not writing and selling like stephen king why am i not writing and selling like jk rowling that type of thing it's easy to do that and say oh my writing's crap right you know it's like mm -hmm. and just like i said yesterday i don't want to write like those people you know maybe they're contemporarily famous brandon sanderson whatever but i don't i want to write like keith hayden what is Keith Hayden write like? Uh, you know, someday in the future, if I'm lucky, somebody will be like, I want to write like Keith Hayden. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to just throw random languages and just not give a care in their books. Like, that could be a thing in the future. But you don't know if you don't explore, like, what your, what your style looks like. You, you don't know that until if you're trying to... It's one thing to look up to the masters, it's an, you know, it's one thing to emulate them when you're first starting. you got to start somewhere. But then eventually, if you do something enough, you're going to form your own style. You're going to form your own opinions about how you think about writing. I have. And I mean, that's where the whole language thing came from. Because for the longest time, I was like, no, all the conventional advice says, don't put foreign languages in your book. Don't confuse your reader. Provide in notes and footnotes and all this shit. If you put in a word, you know, explain it. And I'm like, I don't like that. 
And that's because I, I like to learn languages. And so when I see a foreign language in a book, I'm like, oh, great. What does this mean? You know, like I want to either look it up or something. Uh, that's just me. So I'm like, I know there's other people that are like that. So I'm not writing for people who want footnotes, endnotes and everything spoon fed to them with their with their fiction. I'm not writing for those people. And you, and you have to be OK with that. And that was part of the thing. You know, your work is not for everybody. It's just not going to be for everybody. You have to start excluding people to getting to the people that really need to that will really appreciate it. That's that's one of the steps of actually being a, um, an entrepreneur artist. Yeah, I want to get more into that. But before, to anyone listening to this or watching this, one thing that's useful to think about is what is something that only I could create or something only I could write, a video only I could do, something right. that's deeply Absolutely. entrenched in your personality and your experiences and the things yeah. you've learned. Something that really, like, I think we were put in this world for a reason. And we kind of have to find out. And many times we feel anxious about things or we feel bad about things because we're actually going out of the path we're supposed to be going into, you know? Yeah. So this is one of the key reasons why sometimes people, they, they might even be in a high paying career and, you know, in theory, they should be happy, but in practice, they're miserable because they're not mm. doing what they were supposed to be. Right. And another thing... about copying the big guys mm. this one is still like an artist uh, from Austin yeah, yeah. and if if you're copying just one writer if you're just copying Stephen King mm. that's being a copycat or even plagiarism right. depending on right. how much you copy but if you're copying 10 offers like you get a little bit from one and a little bit from yes. another and then you mix it with things that are coming from inside of you Right. then that's stealing like an artist and that's what artists have done forever really forever and yeah it's yeah. it's like being a dj you get a little bit from this song a little bit from that song and then you put something that you did yourself and and then it's a different song man it's music to my ears man that's one of the things that i do that's part of my routine is reading wide uh widely when i write that's when i do most of my reading actually now is when I write. So I basically have behind me, I have a shelf of just a bunch of books, but then I have two classes of books when I'm writing my novel. I have books that relate to my current project, the supernatural horror novel, and then I have other books. And so I will pull from this books that are related to the novel, and I would literally pull a random book and read a page from it. And sometimes it's nothing. Sometimes it's a page of dialogue. Sometimes it's a, you know, and I have nonfiction as well. So I have some books on writing craft in there mixed in. So those are helpful. But then sometimes you just hit something where you're like, what is that word? What is that structure? What is that, that picture, you know, that they, that the artist did? And how can I integrate that into my work? And this is a practical way for if you're writing fiction to still like an artist because you're taking things that have already been published and written, but then you are remixing. You're forcing yourself to not just, you know, cause I definitely have books that I'm reading casually that I read all the way through and all that stuff. But when I'm writing, I'm, I have a different lens on, I'm not just reading casually. I'm, I'm reading for different structures. I'm reading for, I'm reading for craft. And I think this is something that, if you're a serious fiction writer, you just have to do, you have to get a different lens of, you know, yeah, I have the books that it's just like, okay, I'm just going to open a book and I'm going to read and I'm going to enjoy it. I'm not going to do anything. But then when I'm reading for craft, that's why I'm pulling off all these different books to exactly what you said, to like an artist, to get these ideas to where you don't even know what's going to come out. Your interpretation of what's in that book is going to land in your story. And it might be that serendipitous word, structure, phrase that is like just elevates it. And I've had that so many time with, times with Gates of Okinawa. And that's where I've had the most fun with this revision is 
I want to see what I'm going to be able to unearth next. Like, how can I integrate more stuff into the the existing narrative? Like, I love just playing with that. And maybe it makes the experience a little disjointed. I don't know. I don't know how it looks like in some, but that's that's what it feels like, man. It's so much fun. Yeah, like you said, all of those references, they're passing through the U filter. So mm -hmm. by yep. passing through that and internally, you're mixing and matching with all your experiences and all your references. And then that's what you put out into the paper or into a digital right. document or whatever you're doing. Yeah, exactly, man. And man, I think one thing that we could get into that we've hinted at a lot of times on this podcast and on other talks, but about that aspect of writing that many people, they want to be writers or they are writers already, but they don't have that entrepreneurial spirit and they yeah. don't really know, like, what do I do with this? Okay, so I'm going to write this and then how do I promote it? How can I publish it? Yeah. What should I do with it after? And since you're a master of that craft, like, you know everything, <laughs> like, really... <laughs> Anything thank digital. You, you. Yeah. I'll I'll, yeah. I'll leave the link to the other podcast episode with Keith because that was a lot about digital business and that's right. Yeah. He talks Talked a about lot that about that. But you know everything from podcasting to writing to using AI to help you mm -hmm. as an editor, a VA, everything really. Mm -hmm. Like you've done it all. Music, um, dubbing, you've done you've done it all, landing pages, sites. So yeah. you kind of have that 360 degree vision of it yeah. so if you could talk to that Keith in 2017 who was kind of lost and who was yeah. kind of figuring out what he was going to do like what would you tell him to compress the timeline I would say Keith man you need to get your shit together <laughs> no I'm kidding I'm kidding um it's funny that, you know, when I hear you mention all this stuff, and I really appreciate that, Gabe, but like, man, you make me feel like a, a freaking superstar, man. Oh, but it's um, true, man. I've told you yeah. before, like, you're one of my greatest references, like, when I was first starting out, and I saw you doing all of that stuff, and I was like, dude, that's awesome. And it was like, let me see what I can do, and right. start out a channel, and put shit out, and see what happens. Man, it's, it's it's amazing. I feel like I've I've done it. just by you saying that. I feel like I've I've done enough today, at least. I feel yeah. like it's been it's it's great to hear you say that. But yeah, what I what I would say is that you can't rush the process. You know, you can't because you mentioned all those things, and I think of the reasons why I have all of these skills that I have. And I don't think I would take a different path, even if I magically appeared to myself seven years ago and said, you know, hey, this is what's going to happen. Um, this is how you kind of prepare your mindset for it. But it's really like a lot of people, you know, a lot of the stuff I've learned is out of necessity because I didn't have the money to pay for somebody to do my graphics. So I learned graphics. I didn't have the money to license music on my podcast. So I learned how to make music. I wanted to write my own story. I wanted to write better stories after my first novel. So I got more into, into writing fiction and craft. I wanted to have an audio drama instead of just a bland audio book. So I learned voice acting. I think the takeaway for those listening, you know, you don't have to do everything the hard way that I did because it is the hard way. It takes a long time to get, like I talked about, each of these was a, was a zero start. You got to start over. You don't know anything about voice acting. You don't know anything about music. But it, it's keeping that mindset of, okay, I'm here to learn. I, I don't want to take any shortcuts. And I've always been that way since I was a kid. Like I always, if there's two paths diverging, I'm going to take the one that's through the thicket and through the woods. Um, part of it's just like this adventurous spirit, you know, like we talked about before we started recording. Let me see how far I can go, how good I can get. 
part of it's that. But then it's also, I know when I emerge from the wood, I'm going to have experience. I'm going to have skills that somebody who just took the scenic route or the bus doesn't have, or they took a flight, you know, that is the key thing. And, you know, we've seen it all the time. It's, it's become kind of a platitude on X, but it's like, it's true. Like you, the, you have to be able to learn and unlearn things that that's where the future is going towards to be able to quickly spin yourself up, put yourself in the beginner mindset and then build up quickly and consistently. That is a, going to be a huge skill. It already, it's always been a, a an important skill, but it's going to be even more important. You know, it, we've already seen it, how fast things change. You know, we're on there daily and we see new stuff every day. And all of these things have a huge learning curve. People you know, on sex on X, they make it sound so sexy and simple, right? Like, oh, it just <laughs> I made this app in one day, and you can too. Blah blah blah. You know, they don't tell you that they've been a software engineer. Everyone for like, should have a faceless YouTube channel making everyone should have a month. <laughs> everyone should have a newsletter. It's so easy and fun. Blah blah blah. You know, you'll see these takes all the time on X, but what they don't tell you is that they've been doing it for years, or they've been doing it in obscurity with for no money for a very long time. And of course it's easy to them now, but it's your, your journey is going to look different. That's why most of the, the courses and stuff that you buy and the advice that you follow on places like X and social media, it's bullshit because your starting point is going to be different from that guru. Who's telling you start from here, whatever. It's going to be unique. That journey is yours. You know, Gabe and I were talking about this before we started recording, which is, It's not just business development. You're not just developing your business or your craft. It's also personal development too. And I think that's been the biggest thing that I've gotten from doing this is just overcoming limiting belief of limiting belief that, okay, I can be worth something like my skills are, are, have value. You know, if, if nothing else, there's somebody like you gave, you know, who said that got me to start my channel. That got me, that is just that is just music to my ears that, and and that's what I go for, right? Like I want to people to see me going for stuff and maybe I don't have a lot at this point, but they go for it too, because they're like, damn, look how he's trying. Look how he's busting his ass every day. Even if you don't vibe with my writing, even if you don't vibe with the stuff that I'm making, it's less about that and more that I can try. He could try so I can try too. I, I, that, that's, that's super important to me, but yeah, you talk about the 360 view, like what I would tell my, my younger self. And that's what it is, man. Basically like you're going to go, you're going to have a hard time. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be pretty. And you're going to feel like shit often, sometimes daily for long stretches of time. Okay. Get used to it. And eventually you'll make it to somewhere that you never even imagined that on the the prescribed path that you had, especially, you know, being military, that, that was, you're on a path. And so my life has gone completely off the rails from, the, from where I started. And it, it, there's days when I don't know what to think of it because I'm like so far gone from anything of, like at this point, I have like a basic, basically a second education in online business in fiction writing. Like I, I didn't learn any of this shit in school. The stuff that I use daily now, pretty much none of it outside of the basics, right? Like of writing and whatever, that type of stuff. But all of the daily stuff that I do, like even the technology, like there was no cloud computing when I was a kid, you know, like that type of thing, like how I organize, how I I'm doing this podcast with you. There was nothing like this. This stuff didn't exist. It's all learned skills. Built out of a, of a foundation, of course. Mm-hmm. And what would you tell a writer that's starting out and they don't know about that more business side of things or they want to write, but, you know, 
they're like, how do I start? Like, do I make a site? Do I put things on mm-hmm. Amazon? Do I look for a publishing company, an agent, whatever? Yeah. Like, you want to write, but you have no idea what you're doing. So, what what advice would you give them? Of course, you guys could also DM Keith and ask him for coaching, and mm-hmm. it's very expensive, but it's worth it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Hit me up. No, seriously. If you are, are are in this situation and you're just getting started, I feel you. I, I've been there. And yeah, I want to that my whole goal for starting my business, Aiden Academy Collective Studios, Hack Studios, is to get more original stories out in the world. And we talked about this. We workshopped this, right? This tagline. I actually thought about it this morning. Uh, I want to help you write a story that demands a sequel. An original IP that is all yours, that maybe it doesn't become a movie, maybe it doesn't become a bestseller, but it's yours. And when I show people my book with my name on it, it never fails to impress. And it's not really about impressing, but it's it's really about getting over like these fears of yourself. It's it's this like we're talking about self development. But going back to your question, Gabe, what I would tell somebody who's just starting, don't worry about all the other shit. Just don't worry about it. All the other stuff that you've heard me talk about, this is advanced level stuff. It's it's beyond the scope. Because at the end of the day, if you want to be a writer and you're not writing, you're not a writer. It's plain and simple. You have to write every day. And I don't care if you're writing pen and paper. I don't care if you write on your phone. I don't care if you're scratching words in the sand. I don't care if you use AI. I don't care. What you are doing is you do your job as a writer, especially as a beginner writer, is to take your idea, whatever it is, and believe in it enough to see it through to some end. I don't care if you're writing a poem, a short story, or uh, what's that long novel, that Proust novel, in, In Search of Lost Time. It's like a super long novel. I haven't read it, but... I don't care if you're writing that, a a thousand page behemoth. Your job is to see things through to the end. And I think a good place to start is actually with poetry. And then then I've just been getting into poetry. I haven't been doing, I hadn't been doing much before I started this writing school. But I think it's a great place to, because it's easy to get to start in an end. And then a good thing about poetry is it's very consumable. So you'll get people reading it fast. And it's good for just taking a single idea, a single emotion, a single whatever you want, a single symbol, and developing it into something. It it could be four lines. Hell, it can be one line. It's that easy. I think that's a good place to start. And then you you step up from there. As you keep writing, you're going to see things that you like. You're going to see things that you don't like. I also highly recommend that you read a lot, too, that you read stuff that you like. You don't have to... If you don't like the masters, the so-called masters, don't read them. If you don't like the famous books, if you like, you got to read what you like. I think it was, it's Naval who says like, the best book is the one that you want to finish. The best book mm-hmm. to read. It's not the book that's at the top of the must read list. It's not the hundred greatest books of all time. Maybe you don't care about those books. Then don't read them. If you like genre fiction and you like John Grisham novels, then read those novels. But understand, you know, like I talked about, you should be reading outside of those novels as well. Like try and diversify your your reading stack where you're reading, you know, throw in something that's maybe a little out of, le- out of left field. I know I do this all the time. Like right beside me, I'm not ashamed to admit that I have Apparently, my wife, and I, I've forgotten about this. She's like a huge, man, I hope she doesn't watch this. She's like a huge um, Laurel K. Hamilton fan. Have you have you heard of this author? No, not actually. She writes, like, she's been writing since, like, the 90s. She writes, like, fantasy slash, she basically was writing urban fiction before urban fiction became, like, a defined category. But it's, like, female protagonist. And there's demons, werewolves, fairies, that type of shit. Not something that I normally casually read, right? But I have my wife's entire... She has, like, almost all the fucking books. <laughs> and my wife's so nonchalant about it. She's like... 
She's like, yeah, I have almost all of them. She's like, man, I, she's put out a few more. I need to go get the rest of them. <laughs> so anyway, I have these books. Why? Because one, female protagonist, right? Female protagonist, written by female, especially guys. If you want to write female protagonists or good female characters, you should definitely be reading female protagonists by female authors. You just have to, you have to do that to, because there's a certain way that you want to translate that to the page to do justice to your characters. And that's why I spend a lot of time thinking about that because there's certain things that are going to be easy for you to write. And there's other things that are not. And writing from the perspective of a woman for most guys tends to be a hard thing. And there's no shame in that. You're not a woman. Reading fiction by women for women helps a lot. And I've done that. So this is just one of those aspects of things that I recommend, um, that I strongly recommend, especially, you know, hopefully your novel doesn't have a bunch of just as all dudes. It's a total sausage fest. Hopefully not. But if you do want to write a good female character, you should do that. But that's just one example. <laughs> From other perspectives, from other people who disagree with your word worldview, people who have worldviews that you never even thought of. This is why I like reading a lot of international fiction. And because I can read in Japanese, because I can read in Spanish, I do that. Because it gives you this perspective of the world of somebody who grew up in Brazil, in Central America, in Japan. There's no way you can get that experience. The easiest way to do that is through a book. And then you can kind of synthesize how you think about that and you can include that in your fiction. They just, they just give you more tools in your toolkit to play with. But ignore all this other stuff and make sure you're right. Just start with writing something simple, something that you know. Take that once even idea you have and just believe in it. Because I feel like just those two things, taking the idea and believing it, believing in it, a lot of new writers skip that step. They just start with writing and then they get halfway through it, through the short story even, through the poem even, and they don't finish because they're like, this is no good. It's, it's not. I'm not going to show anybody this. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to actually talk about what I really feel about this. I'm ashamed of being canceled. I'm ashamed of actually how I feel about this thing that I want to write about, this issue that I want, this character that I want to write I, I don't, you don't believe in it enough. You skip that second step. That's the most important part. That's why I see most authors, most writers struggle. Like it, it's amazing how many people have written stuff and it just sits in their drawer and never gets out because they're afraid. Like I talked about, they're afraid of all of the potential consequences that will come if they feel like they do it wrong. Which I'm going to tell you in fiction, there's really no way to do it wrong. There's, there's there's ways to do it better. But if you want to get your stuff read, the wrong way is not just don't finish. Don't put it out. I'm a I'm a big fan. I talk about this on too, actually, on my my coaching page. Finishing. You have got to finish things. If you don't finish, then you don't get, it's hard to get anything out of the project. It's hard to, I mean, hell, even if it's just a poem, if you start it and then you don't finish, even to you, it's nothing. Even to you, you'll go back and read it in a few, like, what was I thinking here? What was I trying to say? It doesn't have any meaning. But if you get to the end of something, it just does something in your brain. Like, it's just like, okay, this is a complete work. You don't even have to post these things. But when you finish something, even I would get this all the time. I've probably written thousands of journals, journal entries over the past two decades. Anytime even I finished a journal entry, a shitty journal entry that was poorly written, I still felt like, okay, that was a complete piece of writing. Because, you know, there's days where I didn't feel like doing it. There's days where I, my heart wasn't into it. I was tired. I would typically write these journal entries at the end of the day when I was in the military and stuff like that. So it was like, I wasn't like in writing mode whenever I did that, but I would still finish them. And the more you finish stuff, the easier it gets to be like, okay, I've got to hit the finish line. And once you hit that, you hit it with a short thing, you can hit it with a longer thing. Then the next thing you know, short stories are coming out. Then you're working on your novel. 
to, and you've just got to keep doing it. Keep, keep doing it every day. If this is what you really want to do, if you want to be a fiction writer, then, then write. That, that's, that's what it comes down to. Don't worry about the graphics. Don't worry about social media. Don't worry about business stuff. Just start writing and get up a body of work to where you've got a pile of stuff behind you. And then when you're ready for social media stuff, send me a DM and I'll gladly help you uh, take it to the next level because the, the technology that we have to translate your fiction, your story to different mediums, it's incredible. It's so much easier than you think and you can do a lot more than just putting a nice cover because th- you know that was basically what we had as novelists in the past. You, you know, you had a nice cover. You Hopefully you had a nice story behind the cover <laughs> and that was it. You know, that's all most writers get. You know, most of us aren't getting the the ten thousand dollar advance, the whole Hollywood, the the billboards, the signs. Most of us don't get that. You got to make your own stuff these days. So you can give yourself that stuff really easily. I can show you how. And any tips on getting over that hump of putting your stuff out there and feeling like you're going to be judged or people mm. will say you're a terrible writer and Actually, some people might comment something, and yeah. the first time that you get a bad comment from a hater, it will hurt, but how can you get over that? Um, You have to do it more often. I mean, it's, you know, I think we talked about this before we started recording. So, yeah, it's developing that, that thick skin, and really, it goes back to that second step, right? Believing in what you're writing. That's what it goes back to. Because if you believe in it so strongly, then how are you going to let some random rando on the internet who is probably not even a writer or they're not a serious writer? Because I've, I've gotten this from non-serious writers too. Uh, meaning like they write, they dabble in writing. They occasionally write a story, but they don't really put anything out. They're not really trying to get people to read them. They just like writing, which is fine. Nothing wrong with that. But we're in the realm of getting people to write our work. And if you're at the stage where you're sharing your work online with intent, with artist intent, then that belief in the idea has to be stronger than some rando comment on Reddit or on X because they will come. I've gotten it. I mean, I like I said, you know, I've been ignored so many times. I'm ignored daily. Um, and then sometimes I'm not ignored. People, yeah, people just can be really mean. You know, especially these days, you know, because there's so much choice. So when people and there there is a lot of there are many examples of really good quality writing of good work. So they'll look at yours and stack it up to everything that they see. This was kind of the problem with the guy that was called my shit amateur. Right. He see all these people that are have these glossy displays and all this stuff on Instagram. But it's like compared to that shit that he sees that he has been primed with. Of course my shit looks amateur. But Gabe, you and I both know amateur shit that millions of views, stick figures. I mean, there's channels, you know, whole YouTube channels, millions of subscribers. You know, like amateur... I'm not going to say it doesn't matter. Because eventually you want to work... If, you, if that's a domain that you care about and you want to work your way up, then okay, then you want to use that as a stepping off point and you want to get better every time. But we're talking about a dis- a snippet of my writing. Like, this is not very important to me. Like, I'm not, it did what it needed to do. It got my writing out there in an image in front of more people. Mission accomplished. There's there's, I, there's not really anything I want to iterate on there. But yeah, getting over that hump just requires doing it more. Because those, like Gabe said, those first few times, it's going to suck. You're gonna put, you're gonna put your, you're gonna put an hour, maybe several hours into your post. You're gonna think about it really hard. You're gonna do all these things, and you're gonna rewrite it, and then you're gonna post it, and nobody's gonna see it because mm-hmm. that's what happens, especially when you're first starting out, like seriously starting out. Because I, you know, like a lot of people, most people have casual accounts on a lot of social media platforms, but when you start exercising that artist intent right and especially a business intent and you want people to find it and consume it it's a different mentality you're looking at it different you're not just posting for your mom or for your brother and sister or for the homies or homegirls 
this is important now. It, it's a different game. And so, yeah, those zero likes, those negative comments, those bot comments, those AI comments, anything that's not a genuine person that actually absorbed the work, it's going to feel like shit. And you will see more of all of the above, what I just said, than you will from actual people who said, oh, this was such a great thing that you wrote. I felt this from it. Because that's not how most people consume social media. They're It's fast. You know, they're not looking for deep things, typically. So that's yeah. another thing you have to be ready for. That people are not sitting down with a cup of coffee and saying, hmm, I wonder what Gabe wrote today. <laughs> I wonder. Yeah. They just want the dopamine. Yeah, I mean, and it happens, right? Like I said, these 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 platforms are engineered for certain things, and it's not just to stick on one one thing. It's for endless things. That's what it is. So you have to keep that in mind when you're starting, and just get over it. Forget that you know the overnight virality. It's probably not going to happen unless you pay for it or something, or unless obviously you know somebody who can really boost you that that quickly, then of course it could probably happen. But I'd argue if you're listening to this, you probably don't have that. So yeah, you're probably going to get no traction. Nobody's going to read it. And even if you do, let me just interrupt you real quick. Oh yeah, no, go ahead. If you don't have anything else to point people towards, mm. okay, you got 10 million views on a video or whatever it is, but you don't have anything else to put pull people towards or you don't have anything to sell them, it's kind of useless actually to yeah. go viral once and if you don't have anything else. Premature virality it can actually be a curse. And I've seen people talk about it. You've seen people, Gabe, you know, I see these posts at least once a week of somebody who went viral and got the wrong type of attention because they went viral for something that they don't really want to be known for. And we see this, you know, the election. People, you know, posting about the election, they know they're going to get a lot of clicks and impressions. And then next thing you know, they're known as the a political commentator when they wanted to be a novelist. It's like, and then next thing, you, your next post is about novel writing or it's about the story that you want to put out. And then you get a hundred unfollows or people don't appreciate it. And you wonder why, right? And that's what Gabe's talking about. Without having that dialed in other things on the back end of course but without having that foundation for what you want to actually be there for you can get swept up in virality and just i, I like that metaphor swept up and just kind of drowned by it mm -hmm. because there it's the audience telling you what they like instead of telling you telling them what they should like about you it's really the wrong way to go when you're first starting because you don't know yet what what works for you you can listen you can listen to us talk about how we done social media but it doesn't matter what matters is how you want to approach it how you want to get the right people to your work that's what matters it doesn't matter what Gabe or Keith have done like you have you can only make that call and it's it only comes after a long time of experimentation it typically it's a long time some people find their thing right off the bat it's rare because there's so much to try. I mean, between videos and live streams and podcasts and, and images, maybe you like taking pictures and that becomes your thing or whatever. You know, like there's so many different things you can experiment with, especially when it comes to to getting your yourself out there, getting your work out there these days, that it's going to take you a while to go through all of them and find out what's the what fits best for you in your lifestyle. What are you most comfortable with? What can you sustain? I think that's a huge factor because a lot of people, they'll hop on a trend and be like, oh, AI images, whatever. And then that trend goes bust or they find out that they hate AI images. And it's like, oh, shit, what do I do now? Starting over again. My learning curve. Everyone's to start over. So it's. Yeah, that's the easiest way to get over it, man. Just start doing it. There's no best time. There's no best, best platform. There's no best time to post. There's no best anything. It's just what works best is the thing that you can keep doing and that you like doing. And that is really demonstrative of what you want to be known for. That's the best thing. Yeah. 
and the audience quality matters a lot and people yeah. don't realize that as well like who follows you and why they yeah. follow you matters a lot yeah and and yeah that's a whole other conversation like actually curating your audience and nurturing them for other things yeah that's a that's more advanced stuff but yeah this beginner level you just want to start getting the right eyes on your work that's where you should start the writing and then just a little bit posting whatever you feel like maybe that's a podcast for you maybe that's videos you have to see you're gonna have to try certain things for a while to see like what's going to be the best Awesome, man. And do you think your definition of success changed since the last time we talked? Ah, man, I had something for this question. I wanted to say something different. Um, no, it hasn't. I mean, it's really the same, basically. It's, it's like I'm doing the things that it, actually it's become clearer. I'll say that because I'm doing what I feel like I have to do, and all signs have been pointing to that I'm in the right place. This year, the last six months have been, I've seen growth, not just like audience or whatever, but like in myself, in my writing, in my confidence as a writer, getting on here talking to you. There's just been more little signs that you made the right call. And you're on the right track, even if it seems like every day is a grind, which it does. There's days where it's just like it's it's a grind, you know, like I'm essentially doing the same things every day for I've been doing it for the past six months. And that that wears on you after a while. But there's a there's a freedom in that. There's a freedom in having the ability to do the routine and to be able to realize those gains because I know they're happening in the background. Um, I definitely have am in a very good situation, like as far as like just the way my life's set up, like that I'm, yeah, I'm relatively free to do stuff like this. You know, like this has been a, a two hour interview. I, I'm free to do stuff like this. This is, this is incredible. You know, like I don't have to dash off to a place. I don't have to have some other commitment. Like I'm free to do this. The writing is its own reward that I'm able to explore, that I've been able to dedicate six months to just writing this story. Um, I mean, and, and it hasn't been without without um, its own struggles, you know, like I, like I said, like you said, I moved recently. So obviously that was a huge upheaval. I was sick for, I was very sick during that time for a few weeks. That was a huge upheaval. Like, I, I mean, it's, it's six months. Think about the last six months of your life. Like it, a lot happens in six months. But to still be able to maintain that, I feel like that's its own success. And the traditional definitions of success, how people see it, you know, money and people reading my work, those objectives, I see those moving closer with with every day. And that I feel like that I've already achieved a level of success that, you know, comfortable in my writing, have a basically an established platform have an established workflow with how I get stuff out. This is stuff that has, as you know, is hard to to pin down because you're constantly grabbing at stuff and the shiny object. And it seems like there's no, it's hard to get to a baseline of of that when you're in this creative space. But man, I feel like I've gotten there. And that allows me to do my just, day in day out routine to know that okay now I can work towards those bigger goals I think of it like having a good relationship actually because for a long time in my life I didn't and I you know I went through when I was younger I went through the the whole dating rat race and everything I did that for many years man I shit we could do a whole podcast on that but yeah I went through it and now for the past almost 10 years I've been with my wife, married for the last five, going on six years. And having that strong foundation of, okay, I know I'm good in that part of my life. I don't, I don't have to, I'm not going to say I don't think about it. I think about it every day, but I don't, I, I don't have to put so much attention on that area of my life. So I can use that as another stability because that's what you want. You want to get to some level of, of homeostasis 
to where I can operate day to day to continue building slowly circling higher and higher and higher and better and better. But I understand that's it's not easy to come by because everybody's life is is different. Everybody's circumstances are set up. But as far as in the context of me, like success, I feel like, you know, you don't build a life by this like this by accident. There's intent there. There's like part of me wanted this, even the it, you know, even subconsciously, part of me want always wanted this level of I didn't know what I was gonna be ever gonna be doing like being a novelist if you had told me this five years ago. Like Yeah, I, I wouldn't have and not say I wouldn't have believed it, but I mean it wasn't on the radar even just five years ago. I mean I was writing my first book five years ago, but I like being a novelist, like just you you're really sticking with that? Is that it? I I, I didn't know that. I didn't see that in the future. And yeah, man, I, I, I feel like you, you build the life that you want. And that's the cool thing about today. There's so many ways to actually be successful and build that life. And I think people don't realize that yet because there's a lot of legacy institutions of the, what the, what the traditional institutions teach you to do really well is wait. They teach you to wait until you're old enough, wait until you graduate, wait until you get your job, wait until you get to retirement, whatever. There's always a, a waiting period. But what I like about now is you don't have to wait. You really don't. It's hard not to wait. Like when you decide to go from passive to active mode, it, it gets hard. You realize how much that you can do and how much, you know, there's there's a huge tide of just, there's going to be people telling you to just stop and wait like they are. But that's what I like about guys like Gabe and, you know, other people that we've met, like JC and things like that. Like, we're not waiting. We're building this shit now. We're building things now. It doesn't matter what you're building, whether you're writing or whatever. Like, you can do it now. Like, you don't have to have permission for somebody to tell you that you can do it. So... That's success for me. Not having to wait. I love that, man. Like, And I love people like you, like JC, like Redham, like all of our friends in our little group, really, that mm. have this high work ethic and you have this vision and you want to accomplish it and you're willing to do what it takes. Of course, as you were saying, I was thinking about consistency not necessarily means you're going to go at it 100% every day because that's not, in not the long possible. run, yeah, that's sustainable. not sustainable. Yeah. But, you know, you can have the ups and downs of life. You, like you got sick and you moved. So, of course, you couldn't go full speed all the time, but you were chipping away at it little yeah. by little. Like whenever you could, you did a little bit here, a little bit there. Sometimes you had those good runs, like a good day, a good week, month even, and you're like really going full speed for a while. But of course you have the ups and downs, but little by little, you're inching closer and closer to that goal. And of course, sometimes we have to change our goals, but you're always striving to go somewhere. And I think right. that's something that that's very important to have, you know? Yeah, I think so. My brother, anything else you'd like to add? Any last thoughts? Anything you'd like to plug? You do so much. Yeah. No, first of all, I want to say thanks, man. Thanks for having me on again. Um, it's always a pleasure My to pleasure, talk man. to you. Yeah, it's it's been great. Uh, I really appreciate your friendship. And yeah, man, I got to get down to Brazil. It's definitely on. It's definitely on the list. You must, man. I'm, I must get down there. A lot of good food. I got. I, I got to remind my wife. She actually asked me last night. By the way, she was like, "Where'd you say your friend lived?" And so it was funny because then th that got us in a discussion about like the Amazon, and we were like, "Yeah, not both of us have no desire to go there." Ah, uh, yeah. It's, I mean, it's beautiful, but I bet it's also it's also a bit hellish because it's so oh, hot and humid. Oh my. And God, we just, we were both sitting there. I was like, man, I'm glad we finally agree on some place with that 
both of us don't really want to go. And I think it's because we're older now and we're like, we know what it's like to be uncomfortable while traveling. And it's a really different level of uncomfortable when you're like in a foreign place and you're uncomfortable. It's one thing to be uncomfortable at home, but when you're like in a situation where it's just like the elements are against you, there's bugs everywhere, you're mm-hmm. sweaty, you're tired, and you don't know like, you know, really what's going on because it's a foreign place. Yeah, we 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 kind of over that. Like we've done it enough. We were looking at all the like creatures y'all got down there in the Amazon. We were like, oh God, we don't want to see that. Yeah. I think there are chiller places in Brazil to go. <laughs> A black caiman. I was like, oh, I don't want to see that. Oh, yeah. No. Jaguars. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. We were like, no, thank you. But yeah, we'd go down there to see you. Um, Yeah, man, this has been a great great conversation i would say to somebody's listening uh, if you're interested in supernatural horror check out gates of okinawa i mean it's i think it's really unique in the fact that it not only combines japanese and english language in an interesting way but then the story is also cross-cultural because that if you've ever been to okinawa that's a huge part of of okinawa is that it is very cross-cultural it's japanese it's chinese it's american and you see it everywhere as soon as you get down there. So it's a big part of the place. It's a big part of the story. And I think it's going to be, I know it's going to be unique. It it already is very unique because of that, that lens. And as I mentioned earlier, if you are writing a story and you're at the point to where you want some development, you want some extra eyes, because I'm going to tell you what, as a novelist, it is very, very difficult to get professional eyes on your work if you can't pay for an editor which most people can't it's very hard to get real feedback on your writing you know especially the way most people read it's very casual they're reading casually and if they like the story they're concentrating on the story they're not concentrating on your prose they're not concentrating on on mechanics they're not concentrating where you where you can tighten things up they don't know that that stuff i do so if you want professional eyes you want me to take a look at one of your chapters then slide me a dm and we can work something out i'd be happy to to help you out in that way because i i read indie fiction all the time i love indie fiction like just no name writer who wrote a book i'm reading a book by right now by a local author here and it's fun because you just get to see like somebody's idea in its raw form there's sometimes there's even no editing you can tell there's been no editing or very little editing and it's just a raw story and sometimes they're really good i i like it so if that's you you want some extra help hit me up and be sure to check out keithhayden.net i've got writing resources there i've got a seven day email course that i can send you i've also got all my other books that i've written i don't just write fiction i've written non-fiction i've written uh sports adventures i've written japanese english readers i've written novellas it, it's it's a thing y'all it's i've been i've been on these writing streets a long time so go and check out my work um as gabe mentioned i also do music i've done a lot of songs for my podcast and for other things I'll check out some of my music and i also have a podcast myself the digital novelist podcast you can find it on spotify and i've been posting videos and episodes on youtube as well and that's me Keith, my brother thank you so much for coming again and to you who are still watching i've left all of the links to Keith's stuff down here in the description and in the first comment and also you should check the first episode we recorded about six months ago in which we went into digital entrepreneurship and everything about digital business you should definitely check that out thank you so much for watching Thank you for watching Rock and Road to Success. I hope you liked this episode with Keith Hayden. If you liked it, you will love the other episode that I recorded with him a few months ago. I'll leave it over here so that you can watch it. It's full of everything you need to know if you want to start your own digital business or if you already have a digital business but you want to upgrade it, you want to learn, you want to improve, you want to get more clients, check it out because you won't regret it.